Good morning. Good to be with you today. This is the this is the Lord's day. It reminds us that the rest of the week it belongs to the Lord. It's to be a catalyst in our life. We're glad to have you with us today. This is the best way to start today is just open God's word together and to learn from him, to lay our heart before him and say, Lord, what do you have for me today? And may that just place uh, an imprint on our heart and carry all the way through the week, uh, just drawing us to Christ, conforming to Christ. We're in the book of Revelation. Uh, what, a, what a treasure it is. It's a delight to us. It challenges our hearts. We have seen uh, two things here in the book of Revelation. We've seen, number one, our Jesus Christ. John writes about the things that were. That's what he saw when the book was first opened up and Jesus appeared to him. He saw Jesus Christ ascended, now glorified, in his majesty and his glory. And then Jesus says, I'm going to communicate to the churches, and I'm going to communicate to you those things that are coming in my program and how I'm going to fulfill that. So in John chapter 2 and 3, we see John communicate that. Jesus writes letters to the churches. He communicates information to seven local specific churches. John writes about the things that are. That's, that's these churches. It's Paul's churches. It's the churches of that day, and it's to his church, which means it's to us as well. <clears throat> we are living in the church age, and what is written in Revelation 2 and 3 is relevant for us as well. We, two weeks ago, we, we looked at the summary of that, and we just saw how it connects into our life. In fact, it calls us to a life-to-life -life ministry every day. Our life related to God, and our life related to the people around us. Chapter 4 moves us into the third section, which takes us all the way to the very end of Revelation. John says, After this, after these things, I looked... A door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place. We saw this last week. That's going to be our next step. We're not there yet. Last week we looked at the rapture. It's a necessary event, I believe, biblically, that takes place before the tribulation takes place, which we see here in Revelation 4 or, and, and moving forward. So we talked about that. We showed that. We revealed that. We just we just did a synopsis, a synopsis of it, just a brief uh, glimpse. There's so much more that could be said. I want to look at one more event today that I think is important. That it's not it's not laid out here in in uh, detail at all here in the book of Revelation, but it's in the Word of God, and I want to lay that before our hearts this morning. That's the beam of seat of Christ. That Christ. That's the that's the judgment seat of Christ. It's this picture, it's this reality of, of us standing before Jesus Christ with accountability as believers. And so we see in, in scriptures, uh, it can be public. Uh, as Jesus was brought before Pilate, it was a public setting. He came before him, he was accountable to him, even though Jesus was fully in charge. But it's the authority of Pilate that's represented here, then ultimately of Christ. But Jesus would come before him and, and his life was in his hands, as it were, although we know his life was in his own hands according to his timetable and his sovereign plan. It can also be private. When Paul was brought before King Agrippa, it was in a private setting, but it still there was a accountability. His life was at the mercy of King Agrippa under, of course, the sovereignty of God. The Bema seat is simply that. It's, it's, a, it's representative of, um, of, a, of a king, a sovereign, on, on a throne, on a platform in which we come before him and our life is before him. And his decision will have ultimate impact over our life, uh, for, for ill or for good. The Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to see here, it's not about salvation. We're going to be talking about it. 1 Corinthians 3, uh, 3 makes it clear, <clears throat> it's, it's about relationship to Jesus Christ, the foundation that we have laid in relation to Jesus Christ. And so what, what was revealed here is the focus of the Bema seat, of the judgment seat of Christ, is the work in our life what we have done. Uh, it's not about whether we're saved. If we are there, we are saved. We are children of God. We belong to Him. We are in relationship. It's about the work that has identified and marked our life. Because it says here at that at very end of that verse, 1 Corinthians, I may receive a word, I may suffer loss, but I, you and I, if we're there, we can have the assurance that we are children of God. We are saved. The Bema Seat, as well, it reveals, and it's going to reveal who we really were, who we are now, but who we were as we look back now upon our life at the Bema Seat. We are reminded in 2 Samuel, as um, God looked upon, ultimately, David for king, 
that was such a surprising choice to his family. He was the last in line. Jesus says, I don't look on the outward appearance, even though David was a handsome man. He says, I look on the heart. The beam of seed is going to be Jesus Christ looking on our heart. It's going to be weighing our motives. It's going to be weighing our intents, our goals, our attitudes, how we did what we did, what we did what we did. All those things are important. We see here as well that we're going to receive what is due. Jesus Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. Jesus is going to reveal, who are you really? I mean, who are you really before the Lord? He already knows that. Who am I? I mean, who am I really? Jesus Christ is going to reveal that. He's going to lay that bare. I will see myself through his eyes. That is sobering. That is challenging. That is motivating. The beam of seed of Christ is, motiv is to be motivated, motivating in our life. It's to give us a constant awareness of the presence of Christ now and that we will stand in the very presence of Christ someday. The beam of seed of Christ reflects relationship. 1 Corinthians 11, If we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined, so that we may not be condemned with the world. See, when Jesus Christ judges us now, before the beam of seed, when He takes care of things in our life now, then we won't be judged then. If we judge ourselves now, if we're honest with ourselves now, if we call sin what it is, confess it before Him, we won't be judged for that. But it's not the sin, it's the work here that we see. We've already mentioned that. Jesus Christ has already taken our judgment. We're not going to be condemned. Uh, it, is a, it is a reflection of relationship that we have in Christ. The Bema Seat is all about Christ. Even though it's us before Him, it is Christ-centered. It is all about Him. It is what He is doing, why He's doing it. It's important. We see here in John chapter 5 that Jesus is going to be the one He will judge. The Father judges no one. He has given all judgment to the Son. He has, he has given judgment to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will be the one before whom we stand. Jesus Christ is going to reveal our lives. It says, when the Lord comes, He will bring to light those things that are now hidden in darkness. And He's going to disclose the purposes of our heart. He's going to look beyond what we've done. He's going to look beyond what everyone else has seen with the determination they've come to as they look at my life. He's going to be able to see below that, underneath that, He's going to see why we did it, the thoughts, motives, and intents of the heart. He will reveal everything. Nothing will be hidden from Him. Not one thing in my life will be hidden from Him. <clears throat> and Jesus will make a determination. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due. I can't receive what I do unless the person who's looking into my life understands everything and sees everything. That's Jesus Christ. He sees it all. And so there will be nothing, no evidence missing. There will be nothing in my life that he will overlook. He will see it all. That's a good thing. The judgment seat of Christ, the bema seat, we often, we often look upon that <clears throat> with, um, with dread. Yet for the believer, there's, there's an element here that is so positive and so motivating and so encouraging. We're going to see, we're going to see that as this unfolds. The bema seat of Christ, as we've said, it involves every believer. If you're a child of God this morning, then this beam of seat, this time before Jesus Christ is for you, it's for I. 1 Corinthians 3, 8. Each of us will receive his wages according to his labor. Our work is going to be that which is revealed. Each one of us, individually, accountable to Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 6. Whatever good that anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is bond servant or free. I like the end of that, bond servant or free. You know what that tells me? Jesus Christ looks upon every believer. He doesn't take into account uh, their status here in life, whether they're wealthy or not, uh, poor or rich, powerful or not. He looks upon us simply across the board equally. We are children of God. We are loved equally by him. And it says here that we will receive back from him that that good that we have done for him. He's going to pour good back into our life here at the Bema Seat of Christ. <clears throat> Romans 14.10 reminds us, why do we look at others and judge others? We're so quick to do that because Paul reminds us here that one day we're going to stand before the Lord and he's going to look into our life. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I just want you to know, I want you to understand 
that none of us will escape this. None of us will miss this. None of us are so good that he'll just overlook us and say, okay, next. He's going to look at all of us with a discerning eye. And he's going to bring into our life that which is due. We've seen here. The being the seat itself is a distinction. It in, in and of itself is a distinction. Revelation 20, it's not. It is not the great white throne. I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. The dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Even those who are unsaved are going to be judged according to what they have done. Their works will be evaluated and judged by the Lord. The Bema Seed believers, the works of believers will be evaluated and judged according to what we have done. This is very important. The Bema Seed is for unbelievers. Uh, the, the great white throne is for unbelievers. The Bema Seed is for believers. That distinction we need to keep very clear in our mind. Because... At the great white throne, if anyone was not found, his name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Everyone here at the great white throne ultimately will find that their name is not written in the book of life. They will be judged according to the works, but they will be judged ultimately because they lack relationship with Jesus Christ. Their name is not in the book of life. That is the defining quality that is most important. The distinction here is, is Christ in you. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. The Bema Seed is not about works. It's about Christ in us. That's important. But works are important as well. See, we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which Christ has prepared beforehand. See, we are his workmanship, that we should walk in him. Our works do not save us but they reveal relationship. Our works do not save us. Your works, what you do for Christ does not save you. There's nothing that you can do for Jesus Christ that can save you. What saves you is relationship. It's whether you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, whether you have received Him as Lord of your life <clears throat> and are following after Him. The distinction is what the works reveal as to whether we will be at the Bema Seat of the great white throne. <clears throat> the distinction is whether we have been transformed by Jesus Christ. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And then there's a list of, of just sins that are related to this context in this book, 1 Corinthians. All these things. If these things define my life, I will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he adds this. But such were some of you. And he says to all of us, you know, you were this. You were, you were captivated in bondage to this sin, but now this is what... You are. You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. The distinction as to whether we are at the beam seat of Christ or the great right throne is this, whether we have been transformed by Jesus Christ, whether our life has changed because of the power of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Another distinction here that separates as to which one we will be at is this, what have we stored up in our life? He will render to each one of us according to our works. You see, our works are so important. They don't save us, but they do define us. I want you to catch that distinction. Your works do not save you, but they do define your life. They do reveal who you are in relationship to. They do reveal that about me. In this context, he says, there are those who have a hard, uh, impenitent heart, and they're storing up for themselves. When I am... <clears throat> and not in relationship to Christ, not a child of God, I am storing up for myself wrath. Those who are self-seeking do not obey the truth, obey unrighteousness. There is going to be wrath, there's going to be fury. In distinction here, there are those who are storing up because of their patience, their desire to live for the glory of God, the honor of God, they're living for immortality, <clears throat> an eye on eternity, he will give eternal life. How I live reveals what I treasure the most. Do I treasure Jesus Christ more than anything else? Or do I treasure myself more than anything else? The works of my life, the works of your life, will reveal which one is the greatest treasure in your life. Another distinction will be which resurrection is yours. We see here in John chapter 5, Do not marvel at this, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. We are all going to be resurrected, believer and unbeliever. It is a promise from the word of God. 
everyone who has ever died, will be resurrected. Those who have done good, those whose lives have revealed Christ, will be resurrected to life. Those who have works that reveal a lack of relationship to Jesus Christ will be resurrected for and to judgment. The Bema Seat of Christ, the Great White Throne. That's the distinction. We see that distinction here. The Bema Seat, the Judgment Seat of Christ, it is after the rapture. 2 Timothy chapter 4, The Lord, He is our righteous judge, will award all believers, will award me, you, on that day, but not only to me, also to all who have loved His appearing. He's going to appear one day. That's a promise. He's coming. He's going to appear twice. He's going to come at the rapture. He's not going to come to earth. He's going to, he's going to descend into heaven and call us up. We will see Him as we are lifted into His presence. The second coming, He will come to earth. He will fulfill his program. The rapture is what we're looking for. That's the next event on his calendar. He will appear. <clears throat> we're going to be resurrected when that takes place. Here we have, here we have a parable, Luke chapter 14, of a man who had a banquet, and, and, and Jesus says, when you have a banquet, invite those ultimately who can't repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Two resurrections. The resurrection of those who are in Jesus Christ, the resurrection of those who are not. There will be a resurrection that takes place. First Thessalonians chapter 4, which we looked at last week. When he returns, when he comes, if we are dead, we will be resurrected to be with him. If we are alive, we will be lifted up to him directly. We also believe that the Bema Seat of Christ is going to happen before the second coming of the Lord, which happens at the end of the tribulation. When Jesus Christ returns at the second coming in Revelation chapter 9, we see this. It was granted to her, the church, to clothe herself. She is clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. They have now already, we have now already, when this takes place, we have already been clothed by the righteousness, the reward of, the, the full promised blessing of Christ into our life. We are now clothed with His righteousness. And we come back with the Bema Seed having been completed. That encounter is now finished. And we are coming back to rule and to reign with Jesus Christ during the Millennial Kingdom and into eternity. The Bema Seed, we have to be clear to, to, to show this. It's not about condemnation. Let's see why that's true. The Bema Seed is not about salvation. It's for believers. We saw that. It's not for unbelievers. Only believers are there. It's not about sin. He's not going to judge our sin there. Psalms tells us, 103, verses 10 and 12, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Aren't you glad? As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. Ultimately, that's what He does and will do. He will separate our sin from us. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. When I am in relationship to him, when I fear him, it shows and reveals that I'm a child of God. Because I'm a child of God, my sins have been, have been forgiven by Jesus Christ. He has taken the wrath of God for me, for you. He has stood in our place. We deserved God's wrath. We deserved and we deserve condemnation. We don't deserve anything good that Jesus Christ has promised. We don't deserve any of that. None of it. Jesus Christ has taken our place and offered us the blessings of all that is His one day. What a joy. We will not be condemned there for our sin. That has taken place at the cross. I want you to know that. He has promised, Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. It cannot be said any clearer than that. You will not be condemned at the great white throne. There's a fear in the heart of every believer about the sin that we've had. It's been said that, that we will stand before the Lord and anything we've not confessed will be dealt with. I've said that before. But I believe that, that what is going to be dealt with at the, at the Bema Seat of Christ is how we have served the Lord our works, not our sin. Our sin is dealt with in His... We'll, we'll see that, okay? Why? Why is that true? Why do I believe that's true? What's the Scripture show us? Hebrews chapter 12. We see this. I will remember their sins no more. Why? Because I will be merciful toward their iniquities. That's his promise. 
That's his promise to us. I'm not going to remember the sins. I'm going to cast them behind me because of mercy. Does he deal with does he deal with our sins now? You better believe it. Yes, he does. The convicting work of the Holy Spirit presses hard on your heart and mine when I'm living in sin. It's because he loves us so much. He's trying to conform us to him now so that I will serve him and receive blessing one day because I yielded to him. When you and I reject the work of the Holy Spirit and we resist him and we refuse to conform, we are in sin, living in sin, violating his heart. We'll not be judged for that, but we will lose reward because we have not taken the opportunity to give our life for Christ. We've wasted opportunity. Sin, it's not about sin. Micah chapter 7. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Why? Because you will have compassion on us. You'll have compassion on us. It is all about Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? None of us could stand. That's, a, that's a, such a sobering truth. If Jesus Christ dealt with you and I according to the sin in our life, currently and what we have done and what we will do, none of us could stand. But with you, there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for his, and in his word, I hope. That's what we see. We have forgiveness in Christ. We stand in the confidence of hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Not only that, we are reminded it's not about sin because he saves us completely. The believer does not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. It's the judgment seat of Christ, but it's not the judgment which is the condemnation of Christ. He's taken that place. He will evaluate, examine, and reveal and judge our works, but he will not judge our sin. This is not about the judgment of our sin. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. This is a beautiful thing, too. You know you're not perfect this morning. I know I'm not perfect this morning. That's a sobering reality. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For our sake he made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When we stand before him, what he will recognize is his righteousness in us. We stand before him. We're able to stand before him at all because we are right with God. Not because we are not because we perfectly live for him. Not because sin was not a part of our life. We stand before him at the beam of seat of Christ because we are we are righteous. He has placed his righteousness, his full righteousness into upon and over your life and mine. We stand before him in his presence, right with him. Even though he's got to deal with our life, we are right with him because of what he's done for us on the cross. 1 Peter 2.24, we are ultimately healed as a, as a result of this time before him. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin, live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. He healed us at the cross when we received Jesus Christ as Savior. He ultimately fulfills and completes that healing as we go through this time of appraisal before him and he refines ultimately all those things He's, he takes away all those things that uh, that are worthless and, and not valuable the work that didn't matter that didn't count that, that wasn't done for his glory it's removed and what is re what remains is is who we are in jesus christ we are finally ultimately healed here he perfects us. He completes us here. Hebrews 10, 14. For by a single offering, he's perfected what? For all time, those who are being sanctified. He's sanctifying us now. He's sending us apart to him. At the beam of seat of Christ, that sanctification will be complete. The work of Jesus Christ in our life will be complete. After that, when we return at the second coming, clothed in righteousness, there will never be a need for sanctification ever again. There will never be a need for him to complete anything else in our life for we are now in fully fully in jesus christ we are his for all eternity enjoying the promises the, the blessings the opportunities the service in the presence of jesus christ the beam of seed of christ is however it is this it's not condemnation but it is a revealing fire everything's going to be tested if anyone builds on the foundation of christ 
with all these qualities. It's our work that's going to be tested. It's going to be revealed by fire. Fire will test what sort of work that each one of us has done. His fire, his revealing fire. If anyone's work is burned up, some of our work is going to be burned up. It'll be worthless. It won't, there will be no value to it. I'm going to suffer loss. But I'm going to be saved. I'm going to be saved. But only as though through fire. The fire is going to, reveal, is going to burn up that work. My service that, that didn't honor him, that didn't reflect his heart, his character, his strength, his humility, the, the quality and the characters of Jesus Christ, it'll burn up, be nothing left. But I will still be a child of God. It's going to be the, the all-examining eye of Jesus Christ. It is, and we need to know this, it's not condemnation, but it is a time of loss. Be clear that this is the reality of the beam of seed of Jesus Christ. It is a time of loss. It's a loss of my work, not his work, my work. 1 Corinthians 3. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. My work, anything that I've done for myself in pride so that others can see, so that others can notice, so that others can affirm me, that work is going to be burned up. That work that I've done, that, that I've been uh, affirmed for, uh, uh, praised for. There's nothing wrong with encouraging others for the way they serve the Lord. We're to be doing that. But if our motivation is that praise, if our motivation is pride, if our motivation is to be seen, then I've lost my reward. I've had my reward already. It's here on earth. I'll, have, I'll not have reward in heaven. There will be work for every believer that will be burned up. It'll be, I'll lay before the Lord and it'll be worthless. And it might have been valuable to me because of what it brought to me, but it meant nothing for the sake of Jesus Christ. There will be a loss of confidence if I have not given my life to Jesus Christ in service. Now, little children, abide in him, remain in him, be true to him, so that when he appears, you and I will have confidence. And so we won't shrink from him in shame at his coming. Here, here's the reality of, of a believer standing before Christ and just feeling shame at how I've not lived my life for Jesus Christ and how I was so selfish at what I did even though the name of Jesus Christ was stamped on my life. I live for myself. There will be shame here for those who have not been faithful to Jesus Christ, who have not served Him with the desire to display the character of Jesus Christ. There will be a loss from a lack of follow-through. Paul says, I discipline my body. I keep it under control. It takes work to be like Christ lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul says, I don't want to be guilty of not following through, of not finishing well to the very end, of starting but not finishing. The rewards of Jesus Christ will reflect not only a moment in time. The reward of Jesus Christ ultimately will reflect a, a, a commitment to be faithful to the very end. That is really key to the very end. Not quitting, not ending, not retiring, not saying I've done it all, I'm finished now. It is being faithful, being active for the Lord to the very end. The way I am active changes as, I, as my life goes through phases, but the Lord expects me to be faithful to the very end. There will be a loss of crowns in my life. Revelation 3, I'm coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. In other words, stay faithful. Don't let anyone take away what you are earning in your relationship with Jesus Christ, don't let temptation, don't let the adversary, don't let difficult people, don't let circumstances, don't let apathy, don't let other things take away what God is doing in your life, the service that you are doing for Him, the passion that you have for Jesus Christ. Don't let anyone to take that away. Stay faithful. Come before Him with, with humility and say, Lord, give me the strength for each day that my your work in me would continue day in and day out. Because when I when I... When I'm not faithful, I lose what I have earned. I lose crown. Not salvation. Never lose salvation. But I don't want to be guilty of losing the crowns that Jesus Christ reward. It is a time of loss. It's a time where there will be angst. It's a time where there will be sorrow. There's a time. It is a time where there will be um, just in, just an emotional trauma in the sense of not having lived a life well or not having done this the way I thought I had before the Lord. But you know what? The beam of seed is also a time of, of reward. I want you to know this, understand this. This is the, this is the great motivation of the, of the beam of seed, of the judgment seat of Christ. Job 23.10. 
simply for being faithful. He knows the way that I take, and when he's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That's process. That's to the very end. That's letting Jesus Christ do his refining work in us. As he's refining, his work is being accomplished. I am, I am doing and being what he wants me to be. He's going to reward that. Luke chapter 19. And he will say, well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in very little, you have authority over ten cities. 1 Corinthians, it's required of stewards, that's what we are, managers of all that he's given to us, that we be found faithful. He's going to reward faithfulness. That's his promise. He's going to reward you and I as we overcome every day, daily. This is the Lord's day. May it be a catalyst in our life to be faithful each day this week, that this, this week would belong to him. And then next week I start again with that commitment before the Lord that we would be overcomers. The one who conquers, who overcomes, will be clothed in white garments. Second coming, clothed in righteousness. I will never blot out his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That's reward. That's reward. Psalm 62. To you, O Lord, belong uh, is steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his works. Know that, that whatever good that anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord. The Lord is always watching. He's always seeing. He will reward your faithfulness and mine. That's his promise. It's a reflection, ultimately, if I do the work of Jesus Christ, it is a reflection of His enablement in my, in my life. When I pray, I'm saying, Lord, I need you. When I come together with the community of Jesus Christ, I say, I need them. I need the body of Christ. We need to, we need to convey our need for others and for Jesus Christ continually. It's a reflection of the divine enablement. Philippians chapter 2. It is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure, to do for His good pleasure. As we obey, as we carry out His work, as we serve Him, we are ultimately reflecting this, that Jesus Christ is at work in my life. I am able to do because He is doing first in my life. I'm submitting to that. I'm yielding to that. We work because of His grace, 1 Corinthians. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace toward me was not in vain. I worked harder than anyone. Don't let God's grace into your life ever be in vain. Don't waste His grace. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. We work, we serve, we do what he would have us to do because of his grace. When we resist the character of Christ, when we resist the grace of God, we waste that blessing, that opportunity. Don't waste that opportunity. Don't, don't waste that. Be what God wants you to be today. Don't wait. Every day I wait, I waste. I waste an opportunity for grace. I waste what he's given to me. I have lost reward. He wants to reward you. He wants to bless you now and in eternity. Colossians 1.29. It is hard work. Paul says, I toil, I struggle, I struggle. That is work. With all his energy that he powerfully works within me. I work hard, but I don't do it alone. I work hard because he is my power. He is my strength. I yield to his strength. When I am weak, when you're weak, yield to to his strength. Slow down. Let go of, of effort. Let go of striving and yield to him. And then in his strength serve. In his strength do what is good. At the beam of seat of Christ, he will give crowns. There are five crowns. You know them. There is the incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians 9.25 When we exercise self-control in our life and we, we exercise self-control to do what we should or to stay away and not do what we shouldn't we will receive a perishable, we will not receive a perishable wrath, but an imperishable, an incorruptible crown. We will receive a crown that, that, that cannot be destroyed, that is eternal. 2 Timothy 2.5, an athlete is not crowned unless he completes according to the rules. We need to compete according to the rules. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as we run a race, we run, we're sort of run so we would obtain the prize. Reward is a motivator in our life. We can say a lot about that as parenting and all those kind of things in the life of the church. But you know what? The fact that Jesus Christ is going to reward me and reward you, that's motivation. That's motivation. Let it motivate your heart. The crown of life, James chapter 1, verse 2. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. When he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. With God has promised to those who love him. Revelation 2, 14. He says to those who are suffering, those who are being tested, those who are in tribulation, be faithful all the way to the end till death. And I will give you the crown of 
life. This is, this is the only crown that is mentioned twice in the Bible. The crown of joy. What is our hope? What is our joy? What is our crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? Is it not you? For, your, for you are our glory and joy. This is, this is a crown of joy over soul winning. This is a crown of joy for, for discipling, for investing Christ in the lives of others. Paul has, Paul has been instrumental in, in, in these being saved. He has been instrumental in them growing in Jesus Christ, being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. When we, when we are doing that work, we will receive the crown of life. I mean, the crown of joy here uh, for investing Christ into the lives of other people. Strive for that. The crown of glory. Shepherd the flock for pastors. But here's the key. Not every pastor is going to receive the, the crown of glory. It's those pastors who do so as who do it as God would have me to do it, as God would have the pastor to do it. The pastor only will receive this crown if he has served, as he has shepherded the flock as God would have him to do that. That is a motivation, of course, to my heart. And it's a challenge. It's an unfading crown of glory. A crown of glory is a crown of righteousness. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to the, all those who have loved his appearing. When I'm right with the Lord, it simply permeates everything that I do. And I, and I long for his appearing because I, because I live every day looking for him to return. Because I live every day anticipating his return. Because I live every day in the presence of the reality of Jesus Christ. I will receive the crown of righteousness. The mark of that is living today in relation to that eternal presence of Jesus Christ. He's with me today. He's with you today. Live because that is true. We see a glimpse here that all the crowns, everything, all, re all rewards that we receive, we will ultimately, it seems, it seems to be reflected here, but we will give back to Him in praise and worship. Revelation 4, verses 9 through 11. You have the four living creatures, and then you have the 24 elders here who fall down before Him who is seated on the throne, and they worship Him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and they were created. These elders will talk about that when we get there. They seem to be reflective of us. What they're doing is what? All that God has given to them, their greatest possession, that is the crown they have received from Christ, they're laying that back at the feet of Jesus Christ in worship and praise. Ultimately, we want to have something to give back to the Lord. We want to receive the affirmation, the stamp of, of the approval of Jesus Christ. We want to receive that reward, that blessing from Jesus Christ. You want to stand before him and hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. But we want to also have something to give back to him in praise and worship. May that be the result of your life and mine. What a terrible thing to be there as a child of God. The blessing is we're a child of God, but then they have nothing to give back to Him because we've not lived for Him well. The beam of seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, it's a time for examination, personal examination of your life. Do you know? Do you know where you stand? 2 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells within you? It is, it is a time to examine, am I a child of God? Does Jesus Christ, does He live in me? Is He... Is he in my heart? Is he in my life? Do I? Does God? Is he my savior? This morning, is the Spirit of God active in my life? Is he active in your life? Do I know that? Are you in a relationship? Paul puts it this way: Examine yourself. Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Every believer ought to be doing this. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you fail to meet the test, I hope that you will find out that that we have not failed the test, that you have not failed the test. Do you know for sure that Jesus Christ, Christ is your Savior? Do you know that? Beyond any shadow of a doubt, do you know that? And we see this in Matthew chapter 25. The parable of the talents. Master says to the servant, 
two servants. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. That's great. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. That's what we desire. Enter into the joy of your master. That's the key. Today, is it your desire to bring joy to your Lord's heart? Uh, really? Do you, is it your desire or my desire to want to bring joy to his heart today? If I don't want that now, that will not be reflected when I stand before him. If I want that now, if I strive for that now, that will be reflected in my time before the Lord. If it's my passion and my desire to bring joy and honor to Jesus Christ today, now, in what I do, in how I do it, that will be reflected in my time as I stand before the Lord, Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are you motivated? Jesus says, I'm coming again. I am coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus. The beam of seat of Jesus Christ calls us into accountability. The beam of seat of Jesus Christ promises to us reward from Jesus Christ. That he never overlooks his servants. He never overlooks the believer. So much of what a Christian does, so much of what a believer does is unseen by the world. The fruit is seen. The spiritual impact is seen. But sometimes even that, many do not see. But Jesus does. He sees it all. One day we're going to be rewarded that. May Jesus say to all of us, well done, good and faithful servants. And along with that, the opportunity for reward. To receive the affirmation of Jesus Christ. That, that look of appreciation from Jesus Christ, but ultimately to have the opportunity to give back to Him praise and honor and glory and crowns that He's given to me. While the Bema Seat can be public, it seems that every picture of the Bema Seat that we see is it's going to be between me and the Lord. It's not, it's not going to be you and I standing before others and everyone seeing our dirty laundry and our sin. Our focus is going to be on us. It's going to be about me with Jesus Christ. I'm not going to care about your laundry. I'm not going to care about your dirt. I'm going to be looking at my own. Jesus Christ is going to be taking my life into account. And so I need to serve each day. You need to serve each day with that in mind. That we would receive his affirmation, his promise. May you serve Jesus Christ well. May you indeed be present at the beam of seat of Christ because you know Jesus Christ as Savior. Take care of that first. If you're a child of God, make things right with the Lord. Serve Him and Him only. Ask God to bless you, to strengthen you, to give you grace, enable you to do what you and I can't do. And strive to be faithful no matter the cost, no matter the circumstances, no matter the difficult people. Serve others. Do it for the glory of God. Lord, we pray that you would indeed motivate our hearts biblically from the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, by the truth of your Scripture, that we would serve you and you only, that we would do it well, that we would be indeed overcomers and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have promised to reward each believer who serves you faithfully, to reward each believer, period, who is a child of God with the greatest blessing of eternal life. Lord, motivate our hearts to righteous living, to faithful living, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let him move into your heart. Consider what he has said to you this morning. Respond to Jesus Christ with your life accordingly, I pray. We'll see you next week. Thank you for joining with us. We'll step back into the flow of Revelation next week and continue.